So now that we know what a wave is, let's turn our concentration to the wave equation. We will first consider the one-dimensional wave equation. For a scalar function f, the one-dimensional wave equation is this one, where the term v is the velocity of this wave. And this wave equation has the simple solution like this, where if we take the minus sign, it would indicate a forward propagating wave. And if we take a plus sign, it would indicate a backward propagating wave. Now look that the function fu needs to be twice differentiable. Otherwise, this equation will not be valid for this function f. So now let's check if this function of x plus minus vt solves the wave equation or not. For that, let us take u to be equal to x plus minus vt. Now, in the wave equation, we need the second derivative of the function f with respect to both x and t. So, let us find out what ddx of f is. By using the chain rule, we can write down ddx of f to be equal to ddu of f and ddx of u. Similarly, we can write down ddt of f to be equal to ddu of f and ddt of u. Now, let us find the value of ddx of u by differentiating this equation with respect to x. So we find out that ddx of u is simply equal to 1. And similarly, ddt of u is equal to plus minus v. So now let us put these values into their respective equations. And what we get is ddx of f is equal to ddu of f and ddt of f is equal to plus minus ddu of f times v. And if we take the second derivative of this one, what do we get? That the second derivative of f with respect to x is equal to second derivative of f with respect to u. And from this, by taking the second derivative we get that the second derivative of f with respect to t is equal to v squared times the second derivative of f with respect to u. Now you see the similarity between these two equations, right? Here we see that the second derivative of f with respect to t is just v squared times the same as the first equation. So if we just multiply the second derivative of f with respect to t by 1 by v squared and subtract that from the first equation, what do we get? We get simply 0. And this is the wave equation. So we see that the function f of x plus minus vt solves the wave equation. Now let us have a look what the wave equation for light waves look like in one dimension. We'll consider only the electric field here and for now we'll consider it to be a scalar quantity. So the wave equation for light looks like this where E is the electric field. Can you guess the velocity of light from this equation? Well, you should do that because the term here should be equal to 1 by V squared. And from that, the velocity will be equal to 1 divided by the square root of mu times epsilon. And if you put the values for mu and epsilon for vacuum, we get exactly 
the speed of light in vacuum. Okay? So now, what is the solution of this equation? We can write down the solution of this electric field by using a linear combination of sine and cosine waves. That is, the cosine of constant times x plus minus vt and sine of constant times x plus minus vt and we multiply these two terms with some constant and add them which is a linear combination of cosine and sine terms. We can also rewrite this term by writing it as kx plus minus omega t. And if we write the equation like this, we'll see that the velocity of this wave will be equal to omega divided by k. Now, we can actually rewrite this solution of this wave equation simply like this. So let's see why we can write like this. For that, we have to use the trigonometric identity, this one. This is simply cos a minus b equal cos a cos b plus sine a sine b. And if we take this one to be a and this one to be b, and expand it, what do we get? We get the constant term here times cosine of a cosine of b plus sine of a sine of b. And if we rewrite a cos theta to be some constant b and a sine theta to be some constant c, then we get exactly the same equation that we had previously. So this is how we can simplify the solution to the wave equation to this equation by changing its argument. And now, what does this theta mean? And what is this constant A? This constant A is known as the amplitude of this wave. So, if we plot a wave like this, then this is the amplitude A. And what is this theta? Well, it is the initial phase. And why is this the initial phase? Well, if we put the value of t to be equal to 0, the only thing that we have after cosine is this theta. So that's why we call this an initial phase. And if we take this initial phase to be equal to zero, the simple cosine wave will start like this. And if we change the argument by putting theta equal maybe two by three pi, then it will shift the amount two by three pi towards this direction, okay? So it will shift the curve like this. And the initial phase of the graph will change. Now let us define some quantities which will help us to define a wave. Some of those quantities will be special quantities and some of them will be temporal quantities. Special will be related to space and temporal will be related to time. So you know, wave is something periodic. The special periodicity is defined by this wavelength, which we define to be the special distance between two crests of a wave. And in case of temporal quantity, the temporal distance between two crests is known as the time period t. By using this lambda, we can define a term called the k vector or wave vector, which is 2 pi over lambda. And also the wave number kappa, which is equal 1 by lambda. 
Similarly, in case of temporal periodicity, and by using this temporal periodicity, we can define angular frequency omega, which will be simply equal 2 pi over this t. And then we'll define frequency nu to be equal to 1 by t, the time period. Now, we have seen the velocity of wave. This velocity of wave is known as the phase velocity. There is another velocity which is known as group velocity. We will come to that later. Now, this phase velocity, how do we define it? Well, we can define it to be lambda of a t, where t is the time period. And if we write 1 over t as nu, the frequency, then v becomes nu lambda. We can also write this phase velocity in terms of omega and k, where k is the k vector or wave vector and omega is the angular frequency. So, you see, if we divide this omega with this k, it becomes again lambda over t. So we can write v to be equal to omega over k. So what is the phase of a wave? The phase is everything inside the cosine. So if we write down the solution of the wave equation like this, then this phi will be the phase of this wave. And for our previous solution, we can write down phi to be equal to kx minus omega t minus theta. In case of three-dimensional wave, this phi is a function of x, y, z and t. And it is not a constant. Like theta was a constant which was defined to be the initial phase. So now we can write down omega, k and v in terms of this phase. So, what is the definition of omega? You can see from this equation that omega can be written as minus d dt of phi. Similarly, k can be defined as d dx of phi. And if we divide this omega by k, we get the velocity v. Now, Many a times, it happens that a wave is constrained by external factors, which we call the boundary conditions. For example, a guitar string is attached at both ends. In this case, only certain wavelengths or frequencies are possible. The possible wavelengths here are lambda, lambda by 2, lambda by 3, lambda by 4, and so on. So this is the fundamental frequency that is possible where we define these to be the nodes and this point to be the antinode. So the next possible frequency is the one where we have three nodes. Previously we had two nodes. And then for the next possible frequency we have four nodes, then five nodes, then six nodes and so on.